Hello and welcome to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. My name is Avram Rosenzweig and I am delighted to be here with you today. Uh, we have a wonderful show. Uh, my guest today is Ye Yehuda uh, Lang, who's a, a Jewish artist, and we will get to that in one moment. Let me begin by saying that uh, this is a live uh, interview and can be seen and heard on Facebook as well on as on YouTube and pretty much all of the important podcast um, outlets. Uh, we have a lot of back shows. We started doing the show a number of months ago. So if you'd like to see some recorded shows, go to avramrosenswag.com. You can see them all there. And by the same token, you can also see them on YouTube. The goal behind my show is really to interview people who I find to be fascinating. And I'm hoping that you'll find them most compelling and interesting as well. Uh, in the past, I've done some shows with really, really auspicious individuals like Severin Ashkenazi, who's a builder of West Hollywood, as well as a builder of post-Holocaust Polish Jewry. Very interesting fellow. Uh, take a look at my interview with Ellie Rubinstein, a dear friend of mine who's a wonderful storyteller, and most recently with Rabbi Shlomo Gemara, who is a Talmud Chacham, who is a, a Talmudic sage, as well as a specialist at, on Agnon. In fact, this week he will be doing a Zoom class on Agnon. If you have any interest in going to it, I'm going to go to it. Please contact me at avram.rosenzweig at gmail.com. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Yehuda Lang grew up in the Toronto Jewish community, started out as a Mizrahi Jew, and today is Lubavitch's Chabad. At some point in his uh, in his very young years, he decided that it could just be that he was an artist. So he started pursuing art. And as life went on, he realized in yeshiva one night in Israel, possibly with a few more beers than he should have had, that this was God's gift to him. And he had to share it with the world. Today, we are very honored to have Yehuda Lang with us. And uh, we're going to talk about a number of things, including October 7th and art, uh, and subsequent in the subsequent days and months in Israel. We're going to talk about his background. We're going to talk about what does Judaism say about art, and a lot more. So stay with us. Once again, it's the Avram Rosenzweig Show, and our guest today is Yehuda Lang. How are you, Yehuda? Good, thank God. Baruch Hashem, thanks for having me. It's, uh, really looking forward. I, I, it's wonderful to have you. I, I love the story that you tell of when you were a little guy. You were like four years old. And your mother and your father wanted to keep you busy. So they bought you a, a, a coloring pad together with crayons. And you started to do what little kids do. Some woman came up to you and said, you know, you're a real artist. And for some reason, her comments stayed with you and um, really helped you to understand that, indeed, that was your gift. You remember those days? Yeah, 100%. 100%. I remember that moment. And it, I was very young, and it was just the power of somebody of creating this own concept in your head. And especially when you're a child, if you tell a child something that you're good or you're smart, uh, you're an artist. I was like, well, they're an adult. I must, I must be an, I must be an artist. She must, she, she must know what she's saying. And that always. Um, from from that point, I think it was always in my head. And even though I, when I look back at my art from when I was younger, it wasn't that great. It really wasn't that great. It wasn't that special. I thought it was. And I think that's always the key. It's not so much necessarily what the final product is, but what's in your head. Uh, and and the same, same thing with music, by the way. I'll just throw this out there. Like when I started playing music, it's very similar. I was about 14, 15, and all my friends were playing guitar. And I, so I wanted to pick up the guitar. Also, I love music. Music is a big, a big part of my um, everything. And I sucked. I was horrible. I was really horrible. All my friends told me I was horrible. Even people in my family. Like when I was playing, it was, it sounded horrible. But all that mattered was in my own head, I thought I was good. Right, right. Exactly. I, I didn't care. I'm like, no, what are you talking about? I'm amazing. Yeah. And I always thought I was good. So it didn't matter. And then you became, and that would allow me to stick it out. You know, Yehuda, when I first started painting as well, I started in 1995. I painted three paintings. I stopped till 2000. And then I started again and I haven't stopped. Um, I remember looking at my art and go, listen, I'm not going to sell this for a dollar less than $5,000. Mm -hmm. Now that's absurd. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> it's ridiculous. I look at that art today that I thought was brilliant. And actually, I'm pulling it out of storage and I'm starting to paint over it to make it something hopefully really special. So I totally, I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Yeah. That's so you, the driving force. That's the driving force is what gets planted in your head. Everything else is, that is the idea of think good and it will be good. That is, a, that is essentially it, which I mean, it's a very common phrase and it's a very powerful phrase that everybody loves, but it's mind over matter and it's the truth. And also you have no idea what you say to somebody, how it affects them. Because that lady, for sure, I really truly believe that my whole life changed, was affected because of that one comment made in 1983 or whatever. I was five years old, four years old. And she had no idea. She'll never know that that changed everything. And then for everything that I did because of that, who, who else was affected because of that one comment that she made to me, and that's a, just goes the power of what you can say to something, good or bad. You can crush somebody as well. Yeah, your your point is outstanding. I tell a story about Erwin Elman, who was really responsible legally for all of the uh, children in Ontario uh, for many many years. And he tells a story. I asked him once. I said, "How is it that young people who grow up in really difficult homes, mothers inebriated, fathers not there, how is it that some of them grow up very sturdy?" and very yeah. standing tall. He said, he told me a story about when he was young, that one of his teachers told him what a brilliant writer he was grade eight, possibly 12 years old. And that like you're saying stuck with him. So I guess the message we're trying to give out here, Yehuda is speak nicely to people, speak well to people and encourage people. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Even if they don't necessarily have it yet, you can bring it out of them. You can, it might be latent, like it might be in them, but they have, it has to be brought out and it's all about the mindset. You know, what's interesting about that is you said that when you teach, you, you really only want to teach talented kids. So how do you tell those kids that aren't talented? I can't teach you. I don't recall saying that. Um, I don't recall saying that. In fact, I think, um, so I taught art for a little while. I taught for about. I don't know, maybe five years or so, six years. COVID, once COVID came, I stopped. And then I just never went back. It was, I was just juggling too many things. And I liked it. And I'll tell you what I, I – actually, the opposite is true. I, I really didn't look at it like that. I would – I mean, it's a bigger question. But I, I think when I was teaching the kids, it wasn't for them to create masterpiece, masterpieces. It was – I had a couple of objectives. I wanted them, to, first, obviously, to enjoy it and for them to be proud of their work. That was – the number one objective but it's also the process it's the process of art and what it does to your mind and it's just another like why do i one of the reasons why i love it is, is another thing i can lose myself in so which is the same thing as music i i often connect it to and i think my, also my style is very music musical mm -hmm. if i if i whatever but, but um you can lose yourself in art and i think there's so you in your own head, not with a distract, not like necessarily because you lose, lose yourself when you're watching a movie or scrolling, which is, I think, more of a negative way. I think when you create art or when I create art, I'm, I'm somewhere else. I'm out, I'm within myself, but somewhere else. I'm not in the world as it is. And I think anybody, where are you? Where are you? Well, that's the thing. It, it's hard to, it's hard. You don't know where you're going to end up, but it's like you go, you get in your head and you, um, Sometimes when you're very, very focused on something with art, everything else um, goes away. Nothing else exists. The more deep, the deeper you go. And, and very often, the art even itself, I, I'm not even there. But my hand's still moving. I'm still seeing stuff. But my mind is um, not necessarily there uh, fully in, in regular like. And what happens then is the greatest art when I'm not there when that's flowing through me. I know it sounds deep and um, a little hippie-ish, but um, that, that's, that's it, I think, with all art types of art. Music, uh, I forget exactly the, um, the pianist, but I heard this from a Y.Y. Jacobson, uh, but a, a pianist that he brought up that was um, the greatest moment when he, like he's some sort of famous pianist, that when it, his greatest moment in, in music is where he's totally not there anymore. And the music is just playing through him. And I think all artists or everybody will know some experience like that where you're just not there anymore. It's just going through you. 
and you're just a channel. And that is when great things happen. Tell me, I, you, you're, you're a religious Jew. You were brought up in Toronto through Mizrahi. Ultimately, you became Chabad Labavitch. I want you to take me a little bit further than the idea of you not being present, or perhaps we'll use another phrase, channeling something through you. When that paintbrush with paint on it hits the canvas, something's happening and you're not entirely there. Just talk, walk me through that a little bit more. Who, who is, who is there if not you? Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. So first of all, I'll mention, it's not so easy to get to. I'd say most sessions that, that I go, that I'll sit down aren't great. I'm actually too much there. Yes. And I'm thinking too much. Sometimes when you're thinking too much, you're not going to, it's like, give up, not give up, but it's time to step away because you're not, you're not getting to that flow. Um, so it's hard to get there. So you really have to, it, it doesn't always come. It's not so automatic. And sorry, I got the track. What was the question again? Where, where is the... When you, when you are in front of your canvas and you're not there, okay? Yeah. And I, I understand what you're saying because yeah. I experienced that myself when I'm painting. Yeah. What I want to know is, A, where are you and who is there? What's happening maybe in metaphysical terms? Well, clearly it is me, but it's more... Um, it's more subconscious level, like it's more, it's a deeper part. It's more epinemious, I would call it, you know, the, the, the deeper parts, the parts where it's not, oh, maybe this will be good, because it's a good question, and I don't, never thought about it much. I usually just say that sentence, and people let me go with that. But um, I really think it's the part of, um, it's the part of you that you're not necessarily trying to be anything. You're not trying to achieve anything. You're not, right, that's usually, I mean, at least with me, I sit down, and it's like it's like stretching. If you don't stretch, you, you're, you're thinking too much. This is how it has to look. This is how it has to be. And I'm just focusing. I remember last time I was able to do it, and it's all, almost mathematical. Well, if I add this, and then it should, it should. No, it's not looking. That I'm not there yet. So it, it's a point where you're not trying to do anything, and you're not even necessarily when you get really, you're not even thinking about it. Sometimes you're just like almost as if you're watching yourself do it, as if it was somebody else. And you're just letting it happen. And my arms, I'm not necessarily thinking about where they're going, but it's just happening. And sometimes my mind is thinking, very often I'm listening to music or I'm listening to a podcast or a sheer, and I'm absorbed and my body is just moving. I'm kind of in the experience, but a little bit out of the experience. And sometimes my mind just wanders. But um, that's what it is. If I had to get it down to the main point, don't try. Don't, I mean, obviously you want to try and you have to think. But that's not losing yourself. In it. Um, usually the magic happens when you're not trying. And I'll just tell you one more thing that I find as a challenge with this aspect. So when I started at least creating my style that I have now, there was something great about it that I wish I can go back to those days. Because what happened then is I, was, um, I wasn't trying anything. I had no idea what my style was. Sorry, I'm going to back up a little bit. So, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. When I... When I um, as an artist, my whole life experience as an artist was what? When I was younger, it was all about um, trying to make things look as, as realistic as possible, mm -hmm. right? Like that is a good artist. How photo-like is it? How close can the realism be? And I, I worked on that for a long time. Like I really pushed. And I was getting better. I was getting quite – I was getting good at it. Um and then I remember what, so I went to OCAD, just I'll throw that in there. I went to OCAD for... Um, for design, Ontario College of Design. Oh, yeah, Ontario College of Art and Design. Um, it's a big university slash college in Toronto, an art college. Anyways, I remember the moment. So the first year, they make you take everything, okay? It's a four-year, four-and-a-half-year program. First year, they make you take everything. And I was doing, um, it was in my, one of my drawing classes. I had a big project. I was working, you know, 20, 30 hours, a little long time on this one picture. And I was, and I was a pencil and I was just like, get it as close as possible. And I remember thinking at one moment, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't want to be a photocopier. Mm -hmm. And especially I was, in, I, I was in art college. So I was with really good competition. Yes. Always. Like people were very good. Always. Yeah. So no matter what, I'm never, I don't, may not be the best approach. I'm never going to be the best at that. Oh, it's hard, man. When you when you go on the internet today, Yehuda, oh and God. you see the brilliant, brilliant artists. Yeah. yeah, it's a challenge. That's a whole different challenge. You it's think yourself, I don't need, I don't need to paint, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so I I remember at the point I'm like, wait a minute, I don't want to be a photocopier. I got to figure out what yeah. what's my style. 
what am I bringing to the table here? And that was a pivotal moment because pretty much from then my style slowly changed. Anyways, back about 10 years ago when I came up with this style, I wasn't trying to do anything. I had no objective. I didn't know where I was supposed to be. I didn't know what it was supposed to look like when I made it, when I started it. And that's why the first couple of pieces that I did in this style, which uh, I was a Miles Davis, I did the rabbit. Those are two big pieces that I really figured out. Wow, this is my, like, I made a couple of mistakes and I let things happen. And I had no idea where it was supposed to end up. And I totally, who knows what was going to come from it. And you can kind of, you can kind of, if you look at the paintings, I think you can kind of see that. It, to me, at least, it looked like a free, like an experience of finding something. Now I really struggle. I have a much bigger challenge because I've already created a style and it's like, I know how it's supposed to look. I know how it's supposed to look like mistakes. And you and it's harder to lose yourself in. Well, let me let me ask you this. Neil Young, uh, the great uh, musician, singer and songwriter, decided at some point that he didn't want to sort of remain in the folk um, rock genre. And he started creating uh, electronic music. It was called trans. It was not well accepted at all. But yes. the beauty of him was that he would go from genre to genre to genre. Bob Dylan did something similar, whom you painted. Yes. Will you stay with the same style your whole life? That, uh, hopefully not. I, I really, I really hope not. I really hope, and I think I am somewhat developing slower than I'd like, but um, I'm trying to do things different. One, one way of handling that is do things different. Don't go with the same templates. You, you kind of build your own templates whether you like it or not. Yes. And they're hard to be creative with. They're hard to have real emotion and real expression in once they become too templated. Um, so you do is you handle different things and you look at it different art. That's the challenge we spoke about before going on Pinterest and going on stuff like that, where I look at these artists, I'm like, oh my gosh. And part of it hurts because I'm like, I will never be that good. But yet I look, I look at a lot of art and I know this is something that I don't steal, but you're supposed to look and you're supposed to borrow. You're yeah. supposed to see, I love those colors. I love that, that, that opacity. Like I'll take one thing from an artist. I love what he does with the background and you don't realize it, but the more art you look at, and you kind of make your own chulant. You took yes. all from this and you took from that. You're going to create your own thing. You have to be careful because I, it drives me nuts when I see artists who just steal. Meaning they're not, they didn't take anything from their own and they just try to copy it, but then take it as their own self. I think it becomes a, I think there becomes a fine line because it, art is supposed to be self-expression. Um, but at the same point, there's a balance because the whole thing of art is you, you know, you see that, you see that, you see that, and then you create like music. Music, you hear a bunch of, you know, this guitar player, that guitar player, and then you, you create your own style. Basically. Yes. You know, it's uh, very interesting that w your your comment a few minutes ago, um, by the way, I'm sorry if I misquoted you uh, a few minutes right. back, yeah, yeah, my, yeah. my mistake, but your, your comments a few minutes ago about, um, you know, uh, wanting to, to be realistic in your art, that really resonates with me because I had that same challenge. I thought that a real artist was only the person who could paint uh, a picture of somebody and it looked almost like a photograph. It looked almost real. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with that for many, many years. But as I went, I started to see artists like uh, uh, Picasso and uh, how originally their art was in fact realism or more so. But as they grew within their art, they started trying many, many different styles. Some artists would go into the area of cubism, right? Impressionism, expressionism, favism, but they never ever ended up where they started. Do you have a, do you have a vision where you could be in five years? No, I don't. I, I, what I I can't think that far ahead, but I have no idea where I'm going to go. However, first of all, with technology now, there, there's a lot of factors in this because technology yes. is changing so rapidly. And you have no idea where it's going. They have the new thing. I forget what it's called, but those goggles. Somebody was just telling me about it yesterday. Those, um, what are they called? The new Apple thing. Yes. Talking about how you're going to be creating art 3D. It's it, the, the whole game is going to change. That's one aspect. The other aspect is, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel like there's no, you shouldn't be able to know where you're going to go. It should be a surprise to you as much as it's a surprise to everybody else. But I do want to mention one more thing about the drawing realistically. 
and how I try to veer away from it. I want to say like this, when you will try to create great art or great creativity of any sort, it's usually about breaking the rules, yes. right? It's, but to know how to break the rules well, you have to know how to follow the rules. You have to know well. the rules, correct. You got to know the rules very well. Otherwise, it's just a mess, which I find sometimes people are doing. I don't, I'm not trying to criticize, but sometimes I find people try to be, well, it's, uh, it's just a mess. It wasn't, it wasn't breaking the rules because I never knew how to do the rules. So therefore, my point is like this, is that I think it's really important for an artist to know how to draw realistically. And, or at least to work on it and to understand how the rules work. Once you know how the rules work, now you can break them properly in order to create magic. So therefore, when I'm making a piece, let's say I, I'm working on a piece and I want to get the, so let's say if it's a person's face, or usually a lot of my stuff is of people of sorts, you know, and I want to get the character of the person. That's almost all I want to get. I want to get the energy that that person brings. So I got it. So therefore, you got to know the likeness, and you yes. got to get the, the heart. What's behind the likeness? Only one. So therefore, it's important to get the likeness, and I and therefore I will also make a lot of practices. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to practice you know, 20 minutes or whatever. Sit down, just trying to draw realistic. It's not something that I necessarily promote or I, that I try to sell, but just to kind of build up that muscle. I just thought that was important, not to totally veer away from the likeness. I, I, I think a lot of people are fascinated by our secrets, Yehuda. Yeah. I, I know that I love going online and hearing how a writer writes. Yeah. I still enjoy very much seeing how a builder builds, especially if they do it with very few resources. Um, and here's a secret that I'd like you to share with our viewers today. You said that, uh, and I believe I'm quoting you correctly here, you said that the greatest stuff in art comes through mistakes. What, what does that mean? Well, well, you, okay. My experience, you know, other, everybody has their own experience. Some people's great art comes through very meticulous, mm -hmm. following everything, getting the shadow, getting every per, everything perfect. My experience mm -hmm. is when I create pieces that I like, and I usually the pieces that people like are pieces that surprised me. That I saw, I'm like, oh, wow, oh, wow. And I caught something. Yeah. Right? You caught something. And they like, got, got me excited. That's usually meaning I didn't plan it. And that could be, um, that could be through many ways. You Okay, well, let me just back up a little bit. I think art, um, and art, this kind of goes back to the whole thing that you mentioned about, I thought it was kind of interesting about the kids with talent or no talent, because I find it very hard to say, because my experience was, I think anybody can, uh, maybe there's some people who really were struggling, but it was more, I think it was anybody. It, art is more about seeing things than about creating things. It's what can I see that's there? What can I find? You know, I, I, you probably know as you're familiar. No, no, no. Listen, listen, you know, in the yeshivot in, in the 19th century, it was not uncommon for the heads of the yeshiva to go for the very, very, very best students, right? Yeah. And I often thought to myself, how do the ones not chosen feel? Yeah. So my question was predicated on that. But if you didn't say it, it's still an interesting thing to approach. How do teachers deal with students, art students, who they don't think are prolific, who they don't think yeah. are brilliant? And by the way, I agree with you, Yehuda, yeah. that almost anyone can paint. The interesting thing about art, and tell me if you agree with this, sometimes you see the greatest painters start at 75 years old. Yeah. Have you seen that? I've, I've seen stuff like that. Somebody or, or they did it when they were little and they came back when they were the 50s. Yes. All yes. Like masterpieces. The yes. Up energy. Um, yeah, I, I hear that. But I, what I wanted to say with um, with art is I think it's more less than a, a creating. The mistakes that are the things that you see when you catch something. If I, if I catch something that, that wasn't intended, and I see a certain thing popping out of something else, right? I see something flowing through. And when I catch that, then I can see where it, where it can go. And that's really where the art is. So that's also about losing yourself. When you're overly thinking, you don't see as much. You're too involved. It's like, you got to step back. You got to be out of it. And um, the ability, so that's the mistakes. That's one of the things. Or it could be actually a mistake when you tried to do one thing and it didn't work out. And then you're like, wait a minute. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I did not intend that, but that is really awesome. And then it's yes. like, 
And then you created something. You don't even try to do them. People think, well, how did you do that? I'm like, I don't even know how I did it because I wasn't meant to be at it. Yeah. And then I try to recreate that mistake. And that, that happens, you know, whatever your medium is. Um, there's many ways, whether you spill something. As we mentioned before, I do um, a lot of my work is digital. So there is a lot of room to move and stretch and layers and back and forth um, with that, which allows you to see things that you would not have otherwise seen. It's hard to create those things. It's more reactionary. And another thing about that now, sorry, once I start talking, all the ideas come, but you got it. Yeah. Well, which is why it's very, so how do you do this? Because I'm like, I'm like listening to this, you might think, well, okay, so I want to make a lot of mistakes. I want to, I want to do this, right? It sounds cool. Yeah. How do you, one, and there are techniques, I think, to try to boost. And it's about, it's about stepping away and coming back and removing yourself. And that's what one of the, a lot of teach, art teachers will say, make sure you move your head away from the canvas every once in a while. See things differently. Look do you ever stand? It. Do you ever stand on your head and look at your art, or flip it over? I've heard about that. I've heard yeah. somebody talking about flipping it over, and in terms of also drawing realistic, like a good exercise, turn yeah. something upside down and draw it is an mm -hmm. amazing exercise. But yeah, same thing. What do you see? It's all about what you see, not about what you created, um, which is counterintuitive. It's just about seeing things. And for instance, one of the things I did—I don't know if you. You can, if you go through my my Facebook or whatever, my Instagram, it's been a couple of years since I've done this, but I've got this thing that wherever I, I see faces and everything. Ah, me too. I, yes. I can't turn it off. It sometimes drives me mad because I can't stop seeing it. Yes, so me too. A, so there was a period of time. Uh, check it out. Check it out on my Facebook. I, it was a couple of years back, but I had this kind of series where I would, I'm like, okay, I'm seeing this all the time. I would take a photo, you know, have a photo. And then I bring it into Photoshop or whatever, and I would draw the character that I see, and I kind of made it, you know, some sort of cute quote next to it or something like that, just to, to you know, give it some life. But that's again the same idea. It's just being loose, and see, you see things. You see amazing characters in a garbage can. Everything. I, and I'm wondering how is it that every single thing that's created, every mechanism is a face. Always the two. I just see it nonstop, and I think it's so weird. There's always two eyes, and then a nose in the middle, or whatever it is going to be. And um, I, I've heard, I've read stuff about it. It's like psycho, it's like psychological. I don't know disorders, but it's something to do with the way your brain's wired. So, so Yehuda, let let let's see if we can use some technology here. Um, this this piece here that you painted, tell tell us uh, tell us a little bit about it. Hmm. This is an interesting piece. I'll tell you why, because this is one piece that I did not want to do. Um, some <laughs> as a friend who was getting married and he, I was camping at the time. He calls me. He's like, I really want you to do my ketubah. I never did a ketubah before. And I wasn't, I don't know, for some reason I wasn't in the mood to do it. I, I kind of kept on pushing them off. I just wasn't really interested, but he like, he was pushing me and he's like, okay. So I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? It. I'm just going to say yes. Cause I'm, I'm bad at saying no sometimes. And I, um, he's like, okay, but we want it to be hearts. And I'm like, oh, I didn't <laughs> want to do hearts. I just didn't want to. I know a lot of people are doing hearts. and I just, Nobody wants to do hearts, no. Yeah, I, I just didn't want to do hearts. Yehuda, by the way, what is a ketubah? What is that? Oh, okay. So a ketubah is a, a marriage contract. Okay. And it is very often people like to do them with hearts. So there's usually, besides over here, you don't see the text on it, but on a marriage contract, there's... A lot of text saying what what the husband's obligated to to the wife and um, yeah it's a marriage contract but people like to do theirs artistically a lot of some people do some people don't but it's not uncommon to have an artistic uh, ketubah so so I ended up going with this I tried to come up with something quick I just wanted to be done and get over get get over with it and again this is also let things happen so. I, I, I didn't have any direction with this. I knew it had to be a heart, so I made the heart. And and what I do, what's a very common theme in a lot of my artwork is the energy of letters. According to Kabbalah, the world is basically everything. Is, the letters, Hebrew letters, is the DNA of the world, so mm -hmm. to speak. And like, for instance, you are your name. You know, you are your Hebrew letters of what your name is. That's why it's very important, um, your Hebrew name. And also what everything is called is, you know, Adam, when... When God created the world, Adam called every, you know, gave every 
like every every creature its name because that was its essence. He was able to yes. see its essence. Yes. So therefore, a lot of my also I think Hebrew letters are beautiful and they create energy and they give a flow. So a lot of so I I just put the two the two of them together, put something quick. I did not put a lot of time. In. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I didn't put a lot of effort into this one. It just came really fast, which my greater my better pieces come really fast. And this is my for sure one of my biggest selling pieces. My most people seem to like this one a lot. Uh, so it's good. Just goes to show the ones that I wouldn't have wanted to do, didn't like. Let it go. Let it go. You know, put yourself aside a little bit and, and, and listen to other people. In fact, very often the things that people tell me, oh, you heard you should make this. And I if I could follow their advice, they're very often the pieces that do really well that people like. So it's like. It, as an artist, I find you like very, you become a little bit, I don't want to say egotistical, but you become like, um, well, what do other people know? Uh, I'll, I know pay, I'll, I'll paint what I want to paint. Yeah, like, don't tell me what to do. You yes. know? But I, I'm telling you, my experience has shown again and again and again, listen to what other people say. Because yeah. very often they're, t- they're telling you things that are correct, even if they've never, don't know anything about art. But again, they're people who see things differently. Yehuda, do you see any faces in this piece? In that's the, why I brought it up originally. I want to see oh, if you okay. saw that's any faces. I, I actually don't. Well, I don't see any faces. <laughs> I mean, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna analyze it and push it, but again, with those faces, it has to be automatic. It's not things that I try. It's like I look at it and boom, and in, in less than a second, it, it, the, the face is in front of me. Once you look into this closely, you're gonna you're gonna see different different details of two eyes and a nose. I see one now that I'm looking towards the bottom. I don't know if my mouse is showing on the video, but um. Over here, there's an eye with a long beard kind of thing. But this isn't one that I had an instant knee-jerk reaction. I I understand completely what you're saying. And I'll give you an example. This, this is an abstract piece that I painted about half a year ago. And I was very deeply honored that uh, my nephew, actually, who lives in Manhattan, bought this and put it up on his wall in his office. And now I can say I have some art in New York. Where's your art, by the way? Where can it be found? Uh, Baruch Hashem, it's in a lot of places. Um, most proudly in Israel. You know, yeah. I have pieces in Israel, which I'm really proud. Of. That's where I love to be. And, and Baruch Hashem, it's in all you know a number of cities across the states and Canada. Good for you. Yeah, good for you. So, so this piece right here, I, I wanted to sort of dive into the world of abstract. Now there are those people really, who say really like this piece. I really like it. I never saw I, it. Before. I do too. And I thank you for saying that. It's always so nice to hear compliments from another artist. It really is, right? Because sometimes we're very, yeah. very critical of one another, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so I painted this piece and after looking at it, and sometimes friends would come to me and say, you know, I see a bird. Uh, yeah, in the, right. the, in, in the cent- central area, or I see another type of animal, or I see a face. And indeed. And again, I'm not quite sure what that is, but nowadays when I paint, I don't consciously say, you know what, I'm going to bury an animal in this area that someone ultimately will see. No, 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 no. It just unfolds. It happens. And it does, by the way, and tell me if you agree with me on this. It does when you start using your tools a little bit differently. When you start to use a palette knife, rather than just scraping it like this, you kind of twist it. Or your brush. You start to use the side of it. Is that your experience? Um, yeah, that's what I was mentioning before in terms of in terms of making mistakes or, or letting things new things happen. Exactly, it's about technique. It's about doing things a little bit differently, and you never know what's going to happen. Well, what's an interesting technique that you just adore, or an interesting tool that you use in your studio? Well, again, I do a lot of a lot of my work is digital, so yes. it's a, with, a, with a tablet. But then I also do as well, like this piece behind me is, is, a, is acrylic. Um, I guess it's a different. Is it, there's different ways, different obviously different brushes, and there's also how you how you throw things and the speed that you move. Sometimes if you're moving too fast, more more unexpected things happen. It, it, how much how much water is in the paint? How 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 it's, how it's going to flow? or how thick it is, how it clumps, and then afterwards, sometimes using your fingers and kind of smearing around that way or finding them. Um, there's this artist that I saw on Instagram or somewhere. It's pretty cool. She just takes different objects around her house and uses them as like a brush. So oh. it's like totally random things. Like, okay, I'm gonna use the bottom of my shoe. Yes. And I'm gonna create the texture with the bottom of my shoe. 
And it's like so cool. And everything that she does was so like she all these different types of textures or all these different types. And you never know what's gonna happen, rather right? exactly what you're saying, always using the same brush in the same way you're most likely going to end up with the same results. I, I find, by the way, that at some point in my art, I become one with the painting. And by that, I mean not, not only in that metaphysical way that you and I were talking about, but also I become full of art. I become full of paint. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and and, and yeah. I, lo I love it because yeah. like Schumacher, the, the, you know, the Formula One driver who said you have to become one with the car. I feel like I'm one with that art. Yeah, and I think yeah, the beautiful yeah. thing about painting whether it's digital, whether it's on canvas, it doesn't matter, is that you become devoted to that piece of art for a week, for two weeks, for a month, and it becomes part of your your reality. Is, is that your experience? It's an interesting question. Um, yeah, usually when you're in a piece, it becomes your reality. That's true. It really, you're living it. You, when you close your eyes, you see it. When you walk away, you see it. I find when I... Um, if I'm if I'm sending like a long day of painting or whatever, like when I then when I go out and I look at people, like let's say I'm drawing somebody like clothes, for instance. Yes. yes. Or whatever it is. And then I go out and I look at people, I'm only seeing their clothes the way I'm like I'm like studying their like the shadows and the lines and the points of conflict, like the like the points of conflict, you know, like which point is like the energy points of, of, of the of the view, whatever I'm looking at. Just like when I'm looking at a painting and I'm studying a picture, where's the points of like, where's the energy burst? That's what I'm looking for in a piece. Where's the point of, I don't know, the words conflict or, and I, and I take that with me. It's, it's like becomes virtual reality. I go out now and I talk to people and I'm like looking at their, the patterns on their clothes and the background. And yeah, if that answers your question in terms of becoming your life afterwards. Yeah, it's hard to shake. Yehuda, this past week we studied the uh, clothing of the uh, the Kohen Gadol, the highest priest, right? And I teach a class on Thursday nights, and I put the picture up of the eight different clothing that he would wear. And I ask people not to look at it in biblical terms or using the filters of Torah that they understand, but more so looking at it just as a regular person, as Avram Rosenzweig, seeing this costume, if you will, and just how it looks to me. Um, what sort of criteria would I use? Do the colors match? Does it make sense? Is God a good designer? Did he yeah. did he hire Bitsalal, the right guy? When you looked at the Cohen Guttles, you were talking about clothing before, yeah. at his uh, at at what he would wear in the tabernacle in the sanctuary. Is that is that a good piece of clothing? Well, I do find it interesting what you said about God as a great designer and how the world, nature, and beauty. I know you're very into going to Earl Bales. I also spend a lot of time at Earl Bales and stuff like that. But yeah. Like, the beauty, God is like the most beautiful. Nature is just the most, God is an amazing artist, basically. Yeah. It's all yeah. the colors, how everything is bold and how it contrasts and goes and part and part. I never thought about the Kong God, though. As in terms of fashion, design, in terms of beauty of, of, of artwork, I hear what you're saying. I think it's a very valid point, especially the whole idea of the Mishkan. It keeps on talking about how it was acquired artists. Artists were acquired to, to make the the tapestries and uh, and uh, everything about the Mishkan was, was really art. In a, in a way, you know, it, it was all art, and it, it was required artists to make it. Um, in terms of the beauty and especially the Choshen, the the, the Choshen Mishpah, where it's all about the different colored rocks and how each and then Torah goes into such a detail describing how it was made and where yeah. it goes. Yeah. And, it's, and it's a piece of beauty, of course. It's gold and it's, and it's supposed to be beautiful. It's purple, trelet, yeah. argaman. Yeah. And how Dude. many weaves, how many threads are, are mixed with the other threads and the created. Yeah. Do you ever walk through nature, say your old bales, a park here in Toronto at Shepherd and Bathurst, and, um, and the colors have come out? Do you get overwhelmed by the colors? Do you, you let me put it in my own context? I look at those colors and then I'll often look up at the sky and I'll go, my God, this is magnificent. And then when you smell the flowers, you say, not only is there aesthetic beauty to it, but there's a fragrance to it. And God loves fragrances, right? Yeah. And it's all it's all one. Uh, well, my response to that is, and it's one of the reasons why um, I, was, I was in Florida last, last year. I went to Florida for um, just one day at a, at a wedding. I literally went there and, uh, and it was right in the dead of the winter. like. And I was coming from Toronto, which 
Unfortunately, it was just gray. It's like weeks and weeks of just gray. The sky is gray. The ground is gray. There's no leaves on the trees. Everywhere you look, it's like maybe a, some other hue, but it's mostly a gray issue. And then it's like I went to go off the plane, and Florida is so lush, and the sky yeah. is so blue, yeah. and the greens are so green, and I felt alive. Right. And I just, I'm like, this, I didn't realize I was missing this. It was one day, but I literally just, it was the color. It's the color of literally the greens of the leaves and the blue of the sky. And the, and the Florida, the leaves and the flowers are just like magnificent, especially when you're coming from like Bathurst and Center. It's just like everything. <laughs> wow. That's really what it is. So it's like. And it's interesting, Yehuda. Did you ever take a look at a lush garden or palm tree? trees in florida or wherever you were and say hmm, they don't match oh that's exactly that's what i'm saying it's always yes. perfect it's always perfect always perfect always beautiful yeah yeah. so yeah. i i want to get into or, you... or or for instance i can just throw this in there i'm also very into animals and like watching animal videos i like that's my i, I love that stuff. i'm fascinated fascinated and i love making art of animals i just love it but if you look at their coats yeah, and you yeah. look at the beauty and how they were created, just just aesthetically, yeah. unbelievable. In order, almost in a way, to impose the feeling of what that animal is, the feeling you're supposed to get from it, an elephant. Just the, I, I have actually a piece of an elephant. One of my favorite pieces, but uh, one of my art pieces fell. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> go but, ahead. Uh, uh, just what it's, just the image of it. I don't know if it works both ways that you know the ele elephant is powerful, so therefore the image makes you feel the power, or if there's something about it, the way Hashem designed it, so to speak, yeah, that yeah. just elicits this power. It's also it's also the creativity of these animals. A trunk on this massive four pot four ton or two ton animal, a trunk surrounded and by passive tusks. Yeah, and what that trunk can do. Listen, I, I I've said before, I believe on this show that uh, I, I'm so deeply intrigued by God's creativity. I figure one day he was sitting with the angel and he says, okay, we need to create an animal that has some mode of, you know, defending itself. And we've done a lot of different defense systems. Let's come up with a new one. How about we come up with one? It defends itself through a smell that it gives off. And he called it a skunk, Right. So I've had my dog attacked by a skunk and it's something that stays with them for a long time. Yeah. But you sit back and you go, my God, this is magnificent. <laughs> Just magnificent. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the creativity to think your power is going to be that you stink. <laughs> exactly. Good. Exactly. So Yehuda, yeah. are you one of those people who's in a sort of a constant state of awe? I wish I was. I wish I was, but I get dulled down. You try to, I try, I wish I was. And I think, um, when I was younger, more so, but I had less discipline. So now I probably have more discipline, but less awe. And yeah. it's about finding the right balance um, because too much awe and not enough discipline is too much power without being channeled properly. Yeah, yeah yes. But um, you got to do things that, um, you got to do things that keep you, that keep you in the moment. And it becomes very, very challenging when you do things for, when um when it becomes a living you know I, I i don't get me wrong i'm very grateful that this is that this is my living and uh, this is what i do i think it's great i really have, but there's challenges in terms of staying inspired and not doing it for money or whatever it is it becomes challenging to do the projects that you love or do things. like i would love i would love it. It, it it gets in the way you would um, love what you would love finish the sentence i would love to be in a world where i didn't have to do the things for the money yes. i wish i can just do the art for the art yes. and that's what i try to do and then god takes care and that's that is the truth it's not far but however in my head at times it's like well if i do this i can make that and then that, that, i can pay that it gets in the way and really like this i'll tell you like this and this is something that i'm only starting to really grasp a little more very recent I always thought like, well, I got to make money. You know, I got kids, right? I got a, I got a family. I have five kids, by the way. And um, Good. so I figured I need to make money, of course. And therefore, I, I, 
God gives me the way I have a talent. I could create art and I can sell that art for money. And that's, that's the way God gave me money. But then I'm starting to think, wait a minute, maybe. So I mean, or, meaning the main objective is I need to make money. How do you do it? You, make, you can make art and sell it. And I'm realizing, wait a minute, maybe it's not that. Yes. Maybe God wants me to create art. Maybe God wants the art out there because it, maybe it helps people. Uh, how are we going to do that? Okay, you got to you got to have some money in order to so you can have a living and you can pay your things. It's just a total shift. Ah, uh, maybe the point is the art and not the money. It, that's and that's like anything, you know. I think it's everybody's career, anybody's mission in this world. You know, sometimes the money we think, ah, oh, it's about the money. So therefore, I got to do this and it makes me money. It's it, it takes a shift to say, wait a minute, no, no, no. The point is the art, and then I, you know, so that's. Do you have any pieces you absolutely will not sell because you are inspired by them? I inspired. Um, I haven't yet. I haven't yet. I've, I've sold that. I've sold all, all my um, original pieces. I have some original pieces, but I would sell probably everything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. Sometimes it is hard. You're like, Oh man, once you go away, you're like, Oh shoot. Um, but ultimately I really believe that my art is not for me. Like, oh, man, I've got so much art around my house. Fees that didn't sell. I, I don't know if you're the same, but I just got so much left over. It's not meant for me to be in my house. It's really, I mean, I want to make it that it should be out there. And you I know would, what I, you know, what I find fascinating in an interview that you had done for Chabad, for Lubavitch, they asked some very good questions and I actually wrote down them. I was inspired by them. One of the, one of the actually points that you brought up, was that on, in in your in your dining room on Shabbat? Apparently, you're facing a particular painting, right? You move them around, but in that time, you yeah. were fa- facing a particular painting, and you said that you were looking at it and you couldn't stop editing it. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's Tell a, us about that. That's a problem. That is really the problem. And and this is also why I'm happy to get. <laughs> I forgot about that aspect. That's what I can't. I I can't stop looking at pieces afterwards. I'm like, oh. Like, why did I do that? like oh I'll, I'll do that forever and I, i'm like more than i have I, first of all i got one piece right now in my house that i but it, it, it sells it, it does well i i don't like it and it's in my house and it's big it's in my house because i have it so it's and, and i look at it all the time and it drives it drives me nuts because there's so yes. many there's so many details about it that i'm like why did i why did i do that why did i do yeah, yeah. Anyways. do you like your art you know i sometimes uh, i i I spend too much time doing, I spend so much time doing it. So like anything else, you eventually, sometimes you get sick of it and you, you like, um, you want to move on from it. And, but I, yeah, I like it. I'm, I'm, I don't want to knock it, but I'm obviously, and I think this is healthy. I think it's good to have a healthy balance of wanting yeah. to be a lot better than you are and not, not to be settled. So I'm definitely there. I'm definitely not like, I'm definitely not like, oh, satisfied. Like, oh, I've hit it. I'm definitely not there. Um, but you don't want to be drive yourself nuts either. I was just listening to the Rebbe, for instance, was uh, one of the one of the main things that everybody knows about him is that people would come to me and say, Rebbe, you'd be so proud. I, I, I we donated a million dollars to this building. And I was like, you think I'm gonna you think I'm gonna be happy with that? I know you can do two million. You always push, always it's never healthy to be satisfied. Uh, so satisfied they're like, ah. Oh. Uh, you can do better. It's about potential, which is really why I, I now I remember why I heard that very recently. I just throwing a perm because we're yesterday we just came from perm katan. But that's one of the things we learned from Machashverosh. Right? Why do we know the whole thing in the first we, we learned the whole first parak of the Megillah talks about Let's give it a context here. Achashverosh was the king of Persia and 70 other countries. He basically ran the world at that time. The story that we read on the upcoming holiday Purim is called the Megillah. It's a story of Esther and Mordechai. So take it from there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we, the first, the, the opening chapter of the Megillah discusses a lot of details about this massive party that Achashverosh threw. And it seems, it seems a little bit much. And it's also important to know that everything in the Torah, if there's one word extra, we got to account for it. Why do we have it? So we're not, we don't just be very wordy to paint a scene. So we let, so it talks about all the different types of materials and the foods and all this stuff. And really, if you want to just get to the heart of the story, you can go start from the second chapter once we bring in Mordechai and the Jews and all this and that. Mm-hmm. So I think the Rebbe says we learn from Mordechai, from Achash Ferosh, that he did not stop halfway. 
if he had something, he did it uh, to the fullest max. He, the idea is to use yourself, use your power, use your potential. Don't be satisfied halfway. Ah, I did something. Okay, but can you do more? Yeah, you can do more. You can push more. And that's what we, one of the interesting things we learned about Achashverosh and that first chapter, which seems to go on endlessly about Achashverosh's party, is to show that he did not stop halfway. Yeah, it's an interesting thing that you're talking about. By the way, in terms of, you know, sometimes getting bored with one's art, Da Vinci said, Leonardo Da Vinci said that he grew weary of the brush. And, and essentially what he was saying is because his stuff was so intricate and that he had to concentrate on it in the most acute way um, that eventually, it, even though he painted only 15 paintings, they were so detailed. The Mona Lisa is the obvious example that um, he just really got tired of it. So I think another secret that we can divulge as artists is, yeah, sometimes you just got to walk away from it. You have to rejig. You have to give yourself that, ex that extra breath. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Judaism and art, October 7th in Israel and art. But before I do that, I want to put a couple of um, quotes by you, and I want you to tell me what you think they mean. Pablo Picasso said, art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. Yeah. Okay. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? The art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. Yeah. I guess if I had to, my first initial response to that is the dreariness of life. If I had to, I don't want to talk about life like that, but it's unfortunately there's a like day to day grind, kind of the what I was talking about before mid December on Batherson Center. Where everything's gray and you're just doing the same get out you know the same thing every day the groundhog's day you know yes. essentially like the grind and the dust of everyday life and um you gotta stop and smell the flowers and art is that it brings a little bit of a boost to the to the grind and, and then put a you, you put a piece in your house on white walls and it changes the room it changes the house it can change the mood in the house and then you know there's the white walls which is the dust of everyday life and then there's the um the art which kind of is the flowers you know the smell the, the fragrance there's a beautiful story that's told i think it's a hasidic story that uh the essence of the story is that yom kippur is that day the most ominous day of the year when what god does is he wipes the gritty slate clean right and it is your opportunity to start painting, to start writing on that tablet as, it, as the one that Moses brought down from Sinai, right? To almost recreate yourself, right? To bring texture, to bring color to your world, to your life. It washes the way the dust, right? So this is something I think you're going to relate to, and it'll be a great segue into our next discussion. Um, Andrew Giddy said, art is a collaboration between God and the artist and the less the artist does the better okay, yeah. tell me tell me about that what do you think that is well that's exactly what i was saying before that's exactly what i was saying before that you're just a channel just like anything you do you're just a channel and everybody is a channel for something else and that's why but where is the, where does the energy come from who knows where it comes from it comes from the deep it comes from god it comes from beyond you and sometimes, you know, how do you channel it? You have to get out of the way. You have to a little bit lower your ego. You have to get lost in what you do. You have to become totally into it. When you do something, you do it fully. You put yourself fully into it. Also, it's a, it, it's a little bit of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a paradox in a way. The more fully you put yourself into it, the more you remo you're removed in a way and you become a channel of godly energy. All we're here to do is bring godly energy into this world in some way or another. Some people do it through art, some people do it through music, math, teacher, whatever it is, you know, and that's, yeah, I guess what I've seen before. You, you know, it's an interesting thing about our people. Um, when one reads the Torah, you would get a really deliberate sense that really art is not something we should be doing. In fact, it says early on in the Torah, you should create no graven images. That has been interpreted in many, many ways over the centuries. Um, I think, and tell me if you agree with me, I think the sense today is that is in reference to what we call Avodah Zorah, right? To idol worship. Don't create graven images like the golden calf that might be aesthetically beautiful, 
because they represent something which is anathema to monotheism. They represent idol worship. So we shouldn't be doing that. But the Lubavitcher Rebbe, when you, people should know, when you say the Rebbe, it's understood today that means the rabbi from Lubavitch, right? He is the Rebbe, right? Yes, so he was highly supportive of art. You are a Lubavitcher Chassid. And uh, he wrote a letter, which was called The Letter to a Depressed Artist. And it was a person who was grappling with his art within a Jewish context. Should I be painting? Should I not? He wrote, in previous generations, um, you know, Hasidim didn't, didn't always work together with art in order to make it something that was an expression of Torah. That wasn't something that was accepted. But he said, today it's much different. He said, today art is actually a vehicle for sharing Torah and, and sharing godliness. What, 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 what is your take on that quote? Well, I think everything is a vehicle to, to express Torah and godliness in some way, or whatever way it does. And art is definitely no exception. And in fact, I think it's art is a very... Um, very obvious one in terms of in terms of that, and, and as we mentioned before, um, with the Mishkan and the Cohen and the Cohen's clothes. Um, originally, this is what I've heard recently as to as to why was the Rebbe so um, why did he place such an emphasis on art and yeah. Judaism and like you're saying being an expression, you know, having Jewish art and Jewish art what was so important and, and if there's details i don't know in terms of you know there's a very famous artist who passed away a couple of years ago baruch nachshon who was i think from Tzfat or some, someone from israel but he has Chevron. Really, he was from Chevron. very like kabbalistic type of artwork anyways the rabbit took great interest in him and the rabbi no about rabbi the rabbi, he um he paid for his schooling in paris paid, yeah and he paid for his living expenses in order that he should continue doing art. And when he did an art show, he did one in 770 that the Rebbe went to, which is a, it might sound not like a big deal for a regular person, but for the Rebbe to come out of his day and to go to an art show, so it, was, it was obviously had his own private audience. And not only that, the Rebbe would go through each piece and critique it. They had very specific, very specific style, very specific instructions how art should be done. So it wasn't like a willy nilly thing, like oh, it's pretty and let's move on and it's nice for kids. You right. know, Yehuda, he looked at one piece that the fellow did, and he said, you know, the clothing that you've put on this character is Assyrian, and in fact, oh, yeah. the context that you're painting in the time, it would have been Egyptian. <laughs> yes, there's a lot yeah. of really interesting, very interesting critiques, and I studied his critiques. Yeah. I studied the Rebbe's critiques on that, but I'll tell you what I heard. Why? Why did the Rebbe have such a big interest in it? And he said, like, this is what I've heard, that originally art was for, as you said, the expression of godliness and Torah. And then what happened is, it got, and, and we see, as you mentioned, the Mishkan was all about supposed to be artists, and it was a way of expression of holiness. And then it got taken by the other side, and it was taken, as you said, for worshiping idols. And it was done, it was taken, I guess as I said, from the, to the other side. And the Rebbe, in order for Mashiach, one of the things that has to happen for, before the Mashiach comes is art has to come back to the side of holiness. Mm. And the Rebbe wanted that to happen. So That's a nice thought. Yeah. You hit on that. I, 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 I can mention one more thing. Yeah, please. About that one aspect is, is how I find there's an unbelievable revival in terms of Jewish art right now. You, you, you see there's so many incredible Jewish artists right now and popping up everywhere. And I think we're all kind of inspiring each other. As, as you mentioned before, you see another artist, and you're like, oh, like I see certain artists, um, and I just see their work, and I'm like, oh, Jewish art. And especially now, I see so many artists inspired. I'm like, okay, I got to do something. I got to do more. And I think people who, are, who wouldn't have come out of the before are now coming out, and it's becoming a massive revolution of Jewish art. And you uh, know what? The, be the beautiful thing about Jewish art is that it is, it's moving out of being predominantly in the shtetl. Yeah. So much of it is Eastern European based, and it's becoming, I would say, much more Israeli, Middle Eastern. Yeah. In fact, there was a school started in 1906 called the Basalo School of yeah. Fine Art, and their, their, their sort of modus operandi was to bring Eastern European art together with Middle Eastern art and create something special out of it. I've heard many people say 
over the years. Not now, though, but in previous years. Oh, you know what? I don't really need an, another menorah painting on my wall you know i don't need another picture a classic uh, uh, uh picasso was of a of a of a Hasidic fellow carrying a torah or jewish art today and tell me yeah. if you agree with me is so creative so different using yeah. so many different symbols it's a breath of fresh air yeah yeah exactly that's exactly what it is. It's, a breath, it's a breath of fresh air it's something that you never saw before it's something new it's a mix of modern i mean and, and, and old and bringing them together and it's got a new life and it's inspiring and it, um yeah and it's also in the jewish music scene as well the jewish music scene is is yeah. blowing up yes. the same way because yes. i think this is we're bringing it back it's an expression of godliness and expression of torah through art very much so so when you're painting you to something jewish and most of your stuff is jewish i would argue you, you could either use a mezuzah, you could use a menorah, you could use uh, a kiddush cup, you could use candles from Shabbat. Is are there a whole plethora of symbols that are available to you nowadays, or is it limited? <sighs> there's a limit. Uh, in terms of mitzvah objects, there's I mean, obviously a limited, and you want something that's going to be an interesting visual. So menorah, that's why everybody goes with the menorah. It's just right away, it's a piece of art before you start it. Um, I have one. One of my first Jewish pieces was a menorah. Um, you're limited, but you have to go more with the Jewish experience sometimes, rather than just the mitzvah object, which are good, which is great. But um, the Jewish experience, um, meaning, you, you know, everybody, everybody. So many people grew up with a picture on their wall of two rabbis learning, and whether they were a religious family or not, they had a fa they have a picture of two rabbis, old grandfathers learning, and uh, whatever it is. It's a Jewish feeling. It could be just a, a a mother and a daughter together, and there's just a feeling together, a family, and um, it's a Jewish experience. And that's where I think more art speaks to people is the experience. Ah, like I know that feeling. I know that experience, and that's why I want it on my wall because I want to keep it in one image and have it there in front of me at all times. So it's about the Jewish experience. It's about very Jewish good. Feeling. Very good. Um, I want to read you something from October 7th, written by someone who's involved in the Israeli art scene. Um, and I got this from the CJ.com. So it reads as follows. Since October 7th, new works of art have emerged in Israel in response to the horrors. Some of the reactions of professional artists using their talents as an outlet for their trauma. Some are amateur but poignant expressions of grief. And many want to document the atrocities for the world to see. Uh, and this new collection of the art war is growing. That's part of this website. Greg Dershowitz, the CEO of Artists for Israel, says that since the organization was set up 13 years ago, it has seen more and more people using art to battle anti-Semitism and anti-Israel forces. He, he says, and we've never seen it as potent and as elaborate at what we're seeing during the war. Finally, he says, this is a time that we're getting requests from a lot of organizations to support their efforts in using art. We're seeing artists take steps forward. We're seeing collectives of artists come out. It is really quite incredible. October 7th is one of those where were you days. And as Jews, we've all experienced it in a very, very deep way. And the anti-Semitism that came out of that day and that has really uh, uh, proliferated, proliferated and grown since then is surprising to so many of us. Yeah, we as artists, there's something in our head which we think, what can I do to counter that, to create more of a balance in the world of love and try to eradicate the evil and the hatred? As an artist, what was your experience with Octo October 7th and afterward? It's a good question. It's a really good question, and it's true. It, there has definitely been a... Uh, a big burst in, uh, in terms, I, I find in terms of art. There's one artist, a Toronto artist, Tanya Zvili. She's creating amazing paintings right now. I just saw one this morning. And I was really, uh, really moved. And but she's a lot of Jewish, uh, Israeli. And these Israeli scenes, one of the hostages that were released. And who I, is I, that? Who who is it? Tanya Zvili. She's a, she's a really really talented uh, okay. painter in Toronto. Okay. Anyways, yeah, you should check her check her artwork out. But she's been doing a lot of artwork in terms of in terms of art in terms of creating art after October seventh. My experience was, uh, in general, it was hard right after. I mean, time 
afterwards it became very hard to do anything that that seemed trivial was it is this worthy is this, is this something that's or doing something that gives you enjoyment you feel a little bit guilty or doing something that brings other people enjoyment and I, I don't know if a lot of people have had that idea to try to listen to music it's not it doesn't feel right to listen to music if, if it brings me joy when what's going on and you know you kind of forget what's going on you're in your own world and you get in the car and you put on some music or whatever it is i'm not saying you should or you shouldn't but these are definitely questions that i struggled with and art was definitely um fell into that it, are we supposed to be sad are we supposed to be and do things that are sad i don't i don't know if that's the re, that's the response i don't think that has been the response i don't think that's necessarily the jewish response to to self it's a horrible obviously what we're going through but it's um i don't think we just take it and and then and not and not continue to live not continue to sing and not continue to listen to music and not to continue to to create art and to inspire others with art i think it's the opposite i think it, it, the etzahara is like which means um kind of like your negative side the part that's going to push you down it's like ah oh, no sulk be sad and, and don't do anything that's joyous or positive and that just prevents everything but really the the response that should have is no more no no whatever we were doing before do it more and do it greater and do it louder and that's what's happened that's what's actually happened so i'll just mention as i mentioned to you before i had an opportunity somebody was going to israel and one of these missions to bring something to the soldiers and the soldiers families and you know you wanted to do as a lot of people have done these missions um and he, he approached me, he's like, he wants to give out, I have this um, artwork, let me just see if I have one around here. Um, I'll show you that for a second. I don't have the stand, but it comes on, it comes on a little stand, this is not a promo, but I just want to show you what it has, it's like this metal piece, I, I print a lot of stuff in metal, and it's a soldier with the Mishaberach for the soldiers, which means a prayer for the safekeeping of the soldiers. And you have a picture of this soul. Anyway, so we he he asked me, he's like, I want to bring some of these and distribute them. And like, I, I was very honored to be able to be part of that, but I'm thinking, okay, I wanted to bring up my first response, I want to get as much as possible. And I want to raise money. So I, I wasn't making I didn't make any money, it was it was totally I wanted to just give it. However, I wanted to print as many as possible. And then I came up with the struggle back to, I think what you're asking is, wait a minute, is this something that we do? Is this something that we're going to raise money for art right now? Is that, is that something that is appropriate? <laughs> I'm going to ask somebody. And he was, he was bringing real necessities also, you know, warm clothes and stuff like that. And like, why should I be bringing, <coughs> getting, isn't this, is this going to take away from real things? That people really need so i went back and forth on it and then i did raise i i was able to send a lot of pieces and i, I it was um i think it's about what you're saying is that it's a spirit is just almost as important or more important i don't know how in comparison but it's extremely important the uh, the spirit of the people yeah the physical needs are of course important but the spirit of the people is is also very important and i saw videos back people send me videos i literally had tears i was crying when i saw videos of soldiers who were holding this and they were touched and i was i was and i i saw and then i realized ah the power the power now now i've got my answer this is, is a power that it's not a price can put on it it's a spirit and, and it awakens you so yeah i guess that's my answer i hope that was I'm not sure if it's clear, but yeah. It was a beautiful answer, Yehuda. Yehuda, were you at Sinai? Are you are you an important part of the Jewish community, of the Jewish people? I hope so. I try you, know why, you know why I asked that question? Because yeah. I can imagine you crying, looking at that, because I've been in the same, I've had that same moment where I felt like I did something for our people, and yeah. it brought tears to my eyes. Not only that I was able to do something, yeah. but I'm part of this people. Yeah. And I put it in terms of were you at Sinai? That's okay, what. Okay. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you'd have seen this video, you also would have cried. It, it was. It was. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. I didn't ever thought about it like that. But yes, it was, it was powerful. Very powerful. We're 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 part of a beautiful people, are we not? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The, the beauty is that we're all so deeply connected to people we've never seen before. Yeah, and we all sort of reflect so much of what the Torah speaks about. Maybe you and I, as artists, maybe we're reflecting or projecting outwardly B'Tselel and his character, the designer of the 
of the Mishkan, you know? I just think we're very, very lucky to be part of this. I really do. Like he was the original artist. And yeah, the original guy, right? He yeah. was young. He was 13. He had an assistant. I love the fact that the Torah actually mentions his name, the yeah. assistant's name, yeah. and that he designed all this. And it's very clear, as you were saying at the top of this interview, that God believes that aesthetics are important. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I want to wrap things up with my uh, friend Yehuda Lang and tell you that you did a magnificent job in this interview. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you for having me. It was a really, really good time. Yeah, I was so excited about what you had to say because so much of it relates to my life as well. And I want you to know, you know, I spend basically a week on my upcoming guests. I read up on them. I study them. I kind of get, you know, a sense of the grapevine, what's going on out there. And people adore your art. They adore it. Thank you. Just love it. Like people, I, I got so many emails or posts saying, oh, I love his art. Thank you. Right. Did, are you good with that? Is your ego enough so that you go, yeah, yeah, I'm an artist and people like my stuff or they love it. Are you good with that? Uh, it, 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 um, I'm, I'm awkward about it. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I, it's like, it's, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very appreciative. I don't want to seem not appreciative, but it's and like a lot of people. I'm awkward with compliments. It, 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 it's an art to learn how to take a compliment. No question about it. No question. I often refer back to the saying in Perke Avod, Eth Ethics of Our Fathers, Ez Ezehu uh, Ashir, who's a rich man, Lomid uh, Samech Bechelka, one who's happy with his lot. And I tell people, you know, who are a little reticent about accepting compliments, look at your stuff, take a breath, say, yeah, I am an artist. Yeah, this is good. Not only according to me, but what others have to say. And then you move on to the next step. Right? I always found it very weird. And I still do, because you're saying I am an artist. I always found it very weird to say that. I don't know well, why. why. I don't know why that was a barrier, and it still is. And I felt like, why do you think, Yehuda? Why do you think? Because it's almost silly. Like I'm a grown man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm a grown man, and like, oh, an artist. You're not an artist. Yeah, you could be a lawyer. Nobody has. I don't think any lawyers <laughs> are, are uh, like hesitant, like to say, but, but I always. It took me a long time. Like I would say, for a long time, I do art. Yes. Like they say, I, I, and even still, it's like a, a little bit of a space in between me saying that and really, um, yeah. It was Van Gogh an artist? Van Gogh is an artist. Was he an artist? Yeah. Um, well, he was through and through. I mean, from my understanding, he was okay. fully through and uh, through. Are I an artist? Yes, yes. I am an uh, artist. Are you an artist? <laughs> okay, yeah, so you bring it around. Okay, fine, I'll get it. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. what's the difference? I'm trying to get from you what the difference is. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't have a, I can't I grasp exactly what it is, but there's, it's a, it took me time. I'm being a bit cocky because I went through the same thing. And honestly, only recently have I started to think, yeah, I'm an artist. Yeah. Yeah. And I know what you're saying about the grown man thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because sometimes there's an arts and arts, there's like a, a, an arts and entertainment component to art. We'll sit down, take out a crayon, and we'll do some scribbling, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I understand that. We're very complex, aren't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. How does yeah. your wife deal with you? I, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. We'll leave that for another show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was great. Oh, it was wonderful. I enjoyed this talk so much. I want to dedicate the show to all of our brothers and sisters in the Israel Defense Force. Courageous, brave, brave young people, and some of whom are older now. I also want to dedicate it to their parents, to their grandparents, to their family for having the courage to grow up in Israel and to send their children off to the army while we here in the diaspora are sending our kids off to university and college. Nothing wrong, but dramatically different. I say that the Israelis who live in Israel, they are in the front line of the Jewish people. And not only are they protecting Israel and what we have within our peoplehood for the Israelis, but they're doing it for us as well. So be conscious of that. Be cognizant of it. Play a role in fighting anti-Semitism. And if you don't know what to do, then just up your level of goodness. I think Yehuda said it very beautifully before. Are we a mournful people? We're not. But we do have Tisha B'Av and we do have Yom Kippur. When we do sort of metaphorically rent our clothings, we don't eat. So there is something about grief within our peoplehood. But then after the 30 days are over, man, we put it, we set up another canvas. 
we pay, we take out and we, we, we spritz out five or six different colors on our, on our, on our, wherever we paint from our palette. And then we go about painting something new. That's who we are as a people. So thank you once again, Yehuda Lang, a Jewish artist. You did a beautiful job. You should go out. Thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah. Wonderful job. And I look forward to being with you again. And next week, next week, uh, I have a live interview again. This one's a secret. But uh, join me because I think you'll, you'll really enjoy it. This has been the Avram Rosenzweig Show. You can catch it on YouTube and you can catch it on Facebook and other podcast outlets. It's a show with fascinating people who have wonderfully inspiring stories to tell. Thank you. I'm Yisrael Chai. Yisrael Chai.